I've told people, if you really want to succeed in this business, you will learn early on that, you know, you're in the people business and real estate's the commodity that we trade in. Hello, welcome to episode 178 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. Joining us today is David Crabtree, broker owner of Home and Ranch Sotheby's International Realty. Located on the central coast of California, David has been selling real estate for more than 30 years. Over that 30 plus year career, David has acquired experience in everything from land development, residential home building, subdividing, and commercial development. Named one of America's top 100 real estate agents in 2018 and 2020, David shares how his past experience shapes his real estate career, how he's transitioned his business into what it is today, and how consistent goal setting has allowed him to achieve his success. But before we get on to today's featured interview, the all new Smart Agents Magazine has launched and is full of insights and strategies designed to help real estate agents grow their businesses. Inside, you will find interviews and advice from leading real estate professionals, marketing tips to flood your business with leads, and even swipe and deploy files full of practical tools to enhance your business. Subscribe now to receive your copy of the printed magazine each month and instantly get access to our online agent community and members only templates. Click the link in the episode description or go to smartagents.com forward slash magazine. Also, if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to like and subscribe. The Smart Agents podcast streams on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and of course, YouTube. And finally, if you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message of feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new stories to share. All right, let's get on to today's featured interview with David Crabtree. I really enjoyed our conversation, and I hope you do as well. Well, uh, really, the way I like to start everything out is if you could just introduce yourself to us a little bit, who you are and where you're at in the country. Yeah, my name's David Crabtree. I'm I'm located in, like, you know, my office is in Templeton, California, but the closest little town that somebody may recognize would be Paso Robles or San Luis Obispo. We're on the central coast of California, about exactly dead center between Los Angeles and San Francisco. I think it's one mile difference going either way. So, Oh, wow. Well, yeah. You really so, can't get much more centrally no, located. No, this is a big, big wine area here. I think we've got three, gosh, between 350 and 400 wineries that are located within, you know, probably a 20 mile radius here. <laughs> so, right. Definitely worse places to uh, be located then. That's yes, for sure. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, what was it that uh, first got you interested in real estate? Oh, I, I, and I've, I've told this to so many people over the years. I think, you know, when I originally got interested in real estate, it was, you know, I, you know, I grew up very poor. I, you know, I'll just put that out there. I, grew up in a mobile home that blew inside and outside at the same time. And so my thought was, you know, hey, if I just work hard and, you know, make money, then my problems will be solved. Well, you get a new set of problems when you do that. But uh, that being said, I was, I was, you know, I was driven. Um, I, I bought my first house when I was 19 and then, you know, bought several more you know, in, the, in the preceding years. But uh you know, when I got into real estate initially, my thought process was, you know, hey, I, I own a couple of properties. And, you know, if I saw the great deal before anybody else did, then, you know, I'd, I'd have an you know inside track and I could take over the world. And that quickly changed when I got into real estate because, you know, then I was dealing with people. And I, you know, it was just fascinating to me. It was, you know, I could listen to somebody, they would, you know, describe what they were looking for. And, you know, I would go out and find it, you know, every day was different, you know, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this out loud. I mean, I, you know, I couldn't believe they were paying me as much as they were paying me to do it. It was, it was just, I, it was like taking a fish and putting them in water. It's like, it was where I was naturally tuned to be. And I just loved it. It was, I could work from, you know, I could be at the office at, you know, seven o'clock in the morning and until nine o'clock at night, I'd basically be calling people until they wouldn't take calls. Um, and it, it was, I've met the most interesting people, and you know, have clients all over the world and have met them through this business. Right. And was that something 
you know, that, um, kind of spark, did that happen almost instantly when you started talking with people and getting in front of them to, uh, help them purchase homes? It did. It was, you know, it was basically the, I've told people, if you really want to succeed in this business, you will learn early on that, you know, you're in the people business and real estate's the commodity that we trade in. And, you know, for me, I, you know, I love being around people. I love hearing what their stories are, where they come from, what are they trying to do? And then, you know, trying to put those pieces of the puzzle together. And so when I first got into it, you know, again, I, I went into it with my own, you know, self of aspiration or aspirations uh, initially thinking, you know, Hey, I'm going to get in this and, you know, you know, I'll, I'll make a lot of money and you know, it'll all be about me. But as soon as I got in the business and started, you know, meeting with people, you know, and they had lives and families and ambitions and helping them put their pieces of the puzzle together, it changed. You know, then it was, you know, wasn't about me, you know, where <laughs> if I've made any mistakes in my careers, it, it would be when I got to the point of looking at the money, <laughs> thinking about, well, okay, how much commission is this going to be? That's, that's a slippery slope. When, when I've made the most and it seems like people are just throwing it at you is when you're not looking for it, when you're just there to, you know, this is a service business. And if we're there to serve people and to help them, the money flows Yeah, you know, and, the, and the rest of it becomes, you know, becomes an easier process. And I, I think as much as you want to put on a front of, you know, who you are and, you know, I'm important and, you know, I'm the best people see right through that. Right. Absolutely. And I think, you know, when you do come from it in that, of that way of, you know, you're just there to really help uh, guide them through the process and, and meet those aspirations. Uh, you know, that turns into that lifelong, you know, referral that just keeps, you know, bringing in more business. Yeah. Somebody asked me, I've got, you know, a property that I'm in, in a transaction with now and I've sold it. Same property. This is the, the fourth sale wow. on that same property. And somebody asked me, I don't know how long ago it was, it's like, what, what is the most times that you've sold the same property? I said 11. Wow. That's crazy. I've been in this business will be will be 34 years in August. And you know if you if you treat people right, you know it's just you know it's like an annuity. It just keeps coming back. I've got some families I'm selling properties to the third generation of the same family. <laughs> yeah. Tell me um so when you first got started in real estate, were you started it, did you get started in the market that you're currently in or were you in a no. different market and moved in? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. And that's, you know, that's, what's funny is, you know, a lot of agents when they're getting into the business, you know, they've, they've watched the, you know, selling sunset and the things on TV and they've got this vision of, you know, I'm going to go sell the, you know, the $50 million estate, you know, on the water. And it's yeah. like, I, I got news for you. You don't get invited to that party. <laughs> you, know, you have to earn your way in, then you'll get invited. Uh, when my first transaction in real estate was selling a condominium to, you know, a good friend of mine, it was his first home. It was $85,000. And, you know, the next one was, you know, probably very similar to that in size. You know, I didn't see any, you know, any, you know, six figure you know, or seven figure transactions for quite a while. Uh, it was, it was just kind of building, you know, building that momentum and, you know, getting a clientele base. And then, you know, most of the time when you get in this business, you, you go in blind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You, you go out and you, you, you take your test and you, you study, you take your test, you get a license and it's congratulations. I'm a real estate agent. <laughs> and you just think, well, this is great. Everybody in the world that I know or have ever met in my life, they're my clients. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They didn't get that memo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, I think that's, a you know, having that, um, 
you know, having that understanding that when you first get in, uh, you know, to really make sure, you know, to not turn down any listing or any deal, regardless of what the commission might be, because you never know what that, you know, that buyer with their, how their life might change later on. And they'll be calling you up to buy their next property or sell and things like that. I, I've told people that often is, you know, you know, certain things you're going to learn in this business is one is it's about the people, real estate, you know, beautiful buildings, homes, you know, estates, they don't sell themselves. People do. You have to understand who they are, what their needs are, what their, you know, what their stress points are. And then you've got to be the person that, you know, comes with the solutions and figures out, you know, how do I, how do I make your life better? You know, it's, you know, rather than, you know, you're there to take something away. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're, we're salespeople and, you know, reality is, you know, people are cautious of salespeople for good reason. And, you know, and, the, and that's just, you know, that's gotten magnified over the years. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the, one of the questions I did want to ask you, um, you know, reading your, your bio, there's uh, a lot of mentions of your, you know, your uh, work in the special emergency response teams and with firefighters. How did that all come about within this, you know, say, I'm assuming it's the same time frame as the real estate yeah, is going on. You know, every, I, I get asked to, you know, speak at different events and stuff like that. And people will always say, you know, tell your story. And, you know, my story isn't, you know, isn't that interesting to me because it's just my life. It's, you know, and you, you know, all of us will, you know, will go through segments in your life where you just do what you have to do, you know, and, and you get through it, you know, however you got to get through it. And like I said, you know, growing up in the, you know, in the situation I did, um, you know, it wasn't, you know, I didn't have abusive parents or anything like that. My, you know, my father passed away when I was 16 of cancer. And, you know, prior to that, you know, my mom couldn't work because she had to stay home and take care of him. So I went to work when I was, you know, 14. And it was, you know, wasn't, I was going to earn money for a car. It was, you know, whatever I brought home being a dishwasher that sometimes paid to keep the lights on and buy food. And sometimes it didn't. Um, so, working was, you know, it was just something that you had to do. And so, you know, going through high school, you know, when I had some, some learning disabilities, I didn't, couldn't really read when I graduated high school. Um, so when, when I got out, you know, I think I graduated on a Thursday, went to work as a firefighter the following Monday and, you know, worked for, you know, Cal Fire, which was a great experience. Um, you know, you're, I always say, you know, animals are smarter than firefighters because they're running away <laughs> from the fire. We're running towards it and smiling at the same time. Um, great experience. Uh, so I, I worked there, you know, but prior to working there, I had worked at a hardware store, you know, through high school, um, or while I was in high school and then went to work for, you know, you know, California, you know, Department of Forestry left there you know went to work as a as a welder i worked as a welder for a while um and at the time you know i thought gosh these these guys are making a ton of money <laughs> and uh, but i i realized early on it really wasn't the the atmosphere i wanted to be around it uh and so i went back to the gentleman that you know had given me a job when i was in high school and he was a, he was a workaholic um, great man. Uh, he's passed now, but I remember going to him and saying, oh, hey, I'll come back to work for you and take a huge pay cut if if you'll teach me, you know, you'll teach me business. And uh, and I said, I'll make this commitment to you. I said, I'll be here before you show up every morning and I'll, I won't leave until after you do. He kind of smirked and smiled. And it was kind of like a challenge. <laughs> this, this guy truly was a workaholic. And, uh, and, you know, his comment to me, he says, you know, that's great. He says, but, uh, you know, if you want to, you know, if you want to be in business, you, you need to go to college. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm not the college type. I want to own my own business. I, you know, 
you know, I'm, I'm not a good, you know, I'm not great at writing and reading and, you know, that's really not my thing. And he says, well, I don't care if you get a degree. He says, but there's things you'll need to know. You'll need to know accounting. You'll need to know business management, marketing. He says, you know, take these courses. And I kind of smirked and said, well, how am I supposed to do that if I'm going to be here before and after you and, and you work forever? <laughs> he just <laughs> laughed and he said, you know, take night courses. And I said, okay. So I did. Uh, and you know, I didn't. I didn't walk away from any of those courses with an A or anything. But I, I muddled through a little bit and and mostly learned from being around him and other people. And uh, did that for you know, for a while and ended up managing uh, two hardware stores for him. Oh. You know, by the time I was nineteen. Oh wow! And then uh, got I had applied for and almost forgot about you know applying for it. But I had applied to go to work for the California Youth Authority. And got a got a call one day saying that you know they had they got the job, <laughs> and I was just like, "This is amazing! <laughs> it's like they're gonna pay me, they're gonna pay me thirty thousand dollars a year, and I only work eight hours a day. <laughs> it's crazy." <laughs> so, I uh, I went to work there, and then uh, while I was working there, you know, opened a clothing store or actually purchased a clothing store from somebody. It was a men's clothing store. And uh, so I had that. And then I got into real estate, you know, shortly thereafter. So my days consisted of, you know, leave the house around four, go work out, you know, go to the clothing store and be in the real estate office by, you know, eight to nine o'clock in the morning and work there till, 1.30 or 2 in the afternoon and report for my 2.30 to 10.30 shift wow. at the Youth Authority. And so when I tell people I get off, people ask me all the time, you know, what's what's the magic? You know, what, do you, what do you do to you know, get to this level? I said, you know, there is no easy button. Yeah. It's, you know, I've, I have figured it out over time, though. It's It's a simple mathematical formula. It's consistency over time. And it's, it's hard work. You know, everyone says, you know, I, I want this. The question is, are you willing to pay the price for what it is you want? Very simple. It's, you know, if you want to be a millionaire, great. There's a lot of them. But you won't find them, you know, partying on the beach, you know, <laughs> five days a week. <laughs> they're they're going to get up early, go to bed early. They're not going to be a lot of fun to be around for a lot of, for a long time. Yeah. But you know, if that's your goal, you can do it. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that the, um, you know, the different jobs that you did have and the different, you know, uh, the people that you interacted with at the hardware store, and then I have to imagine the captains and the people that were your superiors in the fire department, all those people, you know, and all that influence that you got, how much of a, how big of an impact did that play on you having success in real estate? Oh, I think it was a huge success. I mean, obviously, at the hardware store, you're, I was interacting with you know, all walks of people coming in the door and, you know, any, anything from uh, the old guy coming in saying, you know, hey, I, I need a, you know, I need a, I need a nut or a screw this size and, you know, a drill bit that fits it. And you go figure out how to solve their problem. And it's just the interaction with the people. So that was, you know, again, no different than being a you know, a waiter or a waitress or a bartender, you know, you're interacting with people and they're all different. They all got problems and you, you figure out how to deal with it. So that, that was very, you know, that was very helpful. Um, you know, having, you know, Tom Monk, the guy you mentioned with the hardware store as a, as a mentor early on, that was helpful to me, you know, working at the youth authority, those were all multi-felony offenders. You know, we dealt with, you know, Everyone from murderers, rapists, y you name it. They, they were there, hardcore gangbangers. Um, that was a great experience, you know, because you, you know, you had a personality that when you walked in, you, you know, that's who you were. And if you were smart and disciplined, you left that personality when you walked outside the door. But it was like a you know, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde to, to survive in that. Um, but that taught me a lot about, you know, being able to read people because, you know, the people you deal with in the prison, they're, you know, they're master manipulators. 
there, there's two types of people there, victims and predators. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're not one, you're the other. Right. Uh, so it, uh, it gives you, you know, it's a crash, you know, it's a master class on, in humanity, you know, kind of at its lowest level, um, you know, but again, great learning experience. And so, to, you know, basically, you know, be dealing with clientele, talking about selling, you know, properties, and then, you know, an hour later, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting in a, in a quad with you know, a bunch of <laughs> murderers and rapists and you know, gang bangers and what have you. It's, you know, you, you learn to adapt quickly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think also it probably, it helps put into perspective, maybe some of the, uh, the crisis management on, you know, the real estate side, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, dealing with the uh, crisis management inside uh, that quad. Yeah, it's, it's good. Good point. Uh, you know, I have a lot of people will say, "Well, you're always so calm." What what you see on the outside <laughs> should be. Yeah. What's going on inside? It's like you know, it's, that's our job is to kind of keep that in its box. Is I uh, you know, like, there's a lot of people in this business. I call them crazy makers, and they spend their they spend their whole career, their whole life. They take little things and make them big. I spend my entire life trying to take big things and make them small. When I meet with a client and, you know, they're telling me what their crisis is, it's like, okay, let's, you know, let's break that down into, it's like, okay, that's, it's not that bad. <laughs> and, and it's more manageable. If, you know, if your job is to guide your clients through difficult transactions and big, you know, big life changing decisions financially, you know, you know, where they live, all that kind of stuff. They're stressed. They're stressed all the way through the process, whether they, whether you see it or not from the outside, they are. And yeah. when they see you lose it, they're, you know, you're going to have to pull them off the ledge. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So kind of move fast forward in a little bit. Tell me, um, you know, a little bit about uh, getting into the market that you, that you are currently in and, you know, how all that, kind of came about and how you've, um, you know, it, it's just such a, it's a diverse, you know, market there and a lot of different things that you can get yourself into there. Sure. Sure. And, uh, the, you know, like I said, when I got into the business, like everybody, you, you know, you, you, you'll talk to anybody that'll talk to you, you know, success in this business, like it is in most businesses is getting to the point where you deal with the people you want to. And you can pick and choose <laughs> when you're when you're climbing the ladder. You deal with them all: <laughs> um, rich, poor, jerks, you know, nice people, all of them. Um, where where my business really transitioned was, you know, many years ago. And you know, I I've always been a guy that you know says you got to have you know got to have goals. You got to write them down. You got to know what you're gonna what what you're after because then you can gauge you know. Am I close? Am I, you know, did I set my goal too high, too low? You can adjust. I had gone to, I'd gone to a real estate seminar and this is an interesting story. I don't want to get too far off topic, but I, I mean, I applaud anybody that's taking their time to listen to your podcast, to go to seminars, to read books, to become better. Years ago, I had, uh, when, you know, when I got you know, into being a broker, uh, you know, and before I left the youth authority and, and so forth, you know, I, I worked for three brokers that owned the, the office that I worked in. One of them, you know, I was always going to, whenever somebody was in town or close by that was putting on a seminar, I'd go there and I would buy, you know, back then it was the cassette tapes, VHS tapes, whatever it was they were selling, I was buying it <laughs> and I would watch it and I would, you know, I'd pick little pieces out of it, how to, you know, they did this marketing better, or, you know, sent out these kind of letters, whatever it was, I, you know, I jumped on it. Um, one of the brokers I worked for, when I, she asked me about something. I said, well, I'm going to this uh, a seminar on, on Thursday, so I won't be here. And she just, you know, rolled her eyes, shook her head, and she goes, sucker born every minute. She, she, she goes, those people love to see you coming. And I just kind of, you know, 
kind of thought, you know, as as my broker and teacher, that was really not the best thing to say. But you know, you know, I wasn't in a position to question it. But three years later, I bought her out of the business she owned. Oh. But two years prior to that, I was making three times more money than she made. Yeah. Because you take the time to make yourself better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when you, you asked about, you know, where, where it transitioned, I had gone to one of those seminars and I think the guy's name was Rick DeLuca and he had a pretty simple system. He said, you know, and, and I tell agents that all the time. I said, the most important thing that you'll ever possess as a real estate agent or a real estate broker is your sphere of influence, people that you know. And he says, if you don't have one, get one. <laughs> and he said, you know, everybody, he said, everybody in the audience, I don't know how many people were in this, you know, auditorium at the time, you know, should have a sphere of influence of, 200 to 250 people. And he says, I come up with that figure because, you know, nationally at the time, he says the average wedding is 200 to 250 people or funerals. He says, if you don't have that many people on your list, go to a funeral, get some of theirs. They don't need them anymore. He says, but you know, you have their name, their, you know, back then we had mailing addresses, not emails and phone numbers. And he goes, these are people that know you. If you, you know, if you send them something in the mail, they'll look at it. If you call them on the phone, most likely they'll pick up the phone. And so I started putting together my sphere of influence list. And I started, you know, working on that, you know, constantly. And, you know, always trying to grow that and make it bigger and then stay in contact with those people. And, you know, and I did. I went from, you know, and that at that time he asked, you know, you know, what are your goals? I was like, I don't know. He's like, well, how many transactions do you do a year? And at that time, I think I was doing, and I was working the three jobs at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think the year prior I had done like 15 transactions or 18, something like that. And I said, well, okay, my goal for next year is 50. And so then I had to break down, you know, if I'm going to do 50 transactions, what am I going to have to do to get there? I'm going to have to contact this many people, you know, this many phone calls, this many letters, you know, and, you know, so, and, and I hit it, I hit 50. So the next year I, okay, I'm going to raise it, I raised it to 150 and, or to, uh, to a hundred and then, you know, 150. And I think is, I think I had a goal of doing 200 transactions in a year and, you know, I don't, I think I came close, but didn't quite get there and was going absolutely insane, you know, trying to manage all of that. So then I switched my focus to being a, a dollar amount. I'm going to do, you know, this many millions next year. Well, I said, you know, if now, if I just concentrate on bigger ticket properties, I don't have to do as many. I won't go as, quite as crazy. Um, and so then in my strategy of trying to figure out how to do that, you know, we live in a small area I mean, Paso Robles is, you know, back then was smaller, but now it's like 35,000 people. Um, and it wasn't as affluent as it is now. I mean, our big transaction back then was, you know, 600,000. <laughs> um, so then I said, hmm, and I had started dabbling in doing some development and a little spec building. So I said, you know, hey, I'm going to just start meeting more developers and contractors and see if I can find projects for them. And then if I sell them that, you know, when they subdivide it, then I can sell off all of the pieces. And so I was really focused on trying to find properties that could be developed that were higher end product type. And, and I did, and I put one of those deals together and, you know, brought that, you know, brought the investment group together and, you know, ended up selling them the property, sold, you know, all of the properties in that development. And it was both basically a land deal. So then I brought in other people. I had met contractors to build the homes and then sold the homes for them. And so then that just kept 
changing. And, you know, the more of those higher end people I was dealing with, you know, we formed relationships with them. They introduced me to their friends. And then, you know, pretty soon those connections just kept growing and growing. And, you know, now I've got, like I said, I've got clients in, you know, Japan, China, Argentina, France, Italy, you know, Wall Street bankers, hedge fund managers, you name it. So, and that's, you know, and if you treat people right, it just, it's the, the growth doesn't end. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Especially, you know, with, uh, you know, going from the, you know, the land development to the, to the actual home building and the seller, you I mean, that's just, it just starts to build exponentially on itself. And then when you have, you know, when I have to imagine, you know, everybody's happy with the development of that land that they're going to be looking for more pieces of land to develop in your area. It's true. And, you know, I, I tell agents all the time and when they say, well, that's great. You know, I want to get into that. I said, well, here, here's what you don't go to a developer, a builder, an investment banker. What I, what I see often is, uh, and, and I get it now because, you know, we we own a development company. So I'll have, I'll have agents call me and say, hey, would you be interested in buying this? And what, what I get a kick out of, and I guess it's not funny, but it's, it's real, is, you know, say there's a property out there that was $3 million and it got reduced to $2 million. And the you know, agents see, oh, it's a million dollar reduction. You know, wow, that's a great deal. They'll call up the first, you know, person in their Rolodex that they think has, you know, $2 million to spend and say, you know, this is a great deal. You should buy it. The person on the other end of the line is going, why? Well, you know, they just reduced it a million dollars. So what? What, <laughs> what does that mean to me? You have to do the homework up front. You have to be able to have it written out on a piece of paper and say, you know, just like with the group that I work with, it's like, look, we, this is 257 acres. You know, I've done my research. There's a there's a new ordinance in our county called um, transfer development credits. It's it's zoned, you know, rural residential, which you know, maximum or minimum size would be ten acre parcels. Under a TDC program, we can double the density, leave sixty five percent of it open space, put gates on it, sell off small clusters, you know make it very exclusive, you know, and walk them through the process. And I said, you know, here's, here's your, the amount that you're going to pay for the land. Here's my estimate of what it's going to cost to develop it. And here's what it's going to be worth, you know, per parcel when it's done. Well, if you're the person that brought them that, they're like, great, you're in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And when you, um, you know, having that, you know, that Rolodex of clients that are maybe looking to develop in your area. Um, you know, I think it, it is very important to, you know, to be up to date on when any type, you know, maybe there's a zoning ordinance that does change to be right on it and to be able to reach out, you know, if that is going to help push somebody over, then maybe that was what was holding them back from, uh, going forward with a deal is that there was a, a little bit of a zoning issue or something like that, that might change. Right. Uh, how important is it to be uh, really organized with all those things and knowing all those needs that your, you know, your client's looking for? I mean, it's important, but again, you don't have to be the expert. I mean, you, again, I, I tell people I'm a very, you know, I, I'm certainly not an engineer's mind. I'm more of a 30,000 foot view, you know, concept type guy versus down in the weeds. But, you know, to be, you know, to be a good real estate agent or broker, to be a good developer, you know, to be a good banker, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. You have to be able to know, one, what you don't know, and be able to find the best people that do know that and put together a good team. So when I was trying to figure that stuff out, you know, 
you know, I, I didn't know all the ins and outs of it. I just kind of had a concept as like, you know, okay, I transfer development credit from here. It's like, well, how does that happen? Well, I, I had to go ask people. So I, I started talking with, you know, civil engineering firms. Say, okay, well, how does this program work? And, you know, if we had a program or a project like that, would you guys, you know, would you guys want to handle it? Well, of course. Well, now they're on your team. Yeah. They're going to give you any information you can that, you know, because you're going to benefit that. You know, learn, figure out what you don't know, and then, you know, start figuring out what are the resources. You know, and it doesn't matter if it's, you know, large scale development project or if it's a simple, you know, two bedroom, three bedroom house. It's like, okay, well, what does this need? Well, it needs a paint job. Well, I've got a painter. You become, you know, like when we started the bank years ago, that was one of the things as the board of directors when we were, it's like, hey, we're going to, this is going to be our clientele group. We're going to put together and be, you know, kind of like a concierge for all of our customers. If you need the best attorney, the best financial planner, you know, an estate lawyer for wills and trusts, it's like, you don't have to go find it. You could, you could call us and we'll tell you, hey, you know, we vetted these people. They're the best. You just you just made people's life easy. You know, same as a real estate agent. You know, your job is to, you know, be able to field the question, understand what their need is, and say, I've got a guy. <laughs> and then then you become the guy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. When uh you know, for these particular um properties and like you said you have clients all over the world um mm -hmm. how are you marketing these projects uh to these different groups worldwide <clears throat> well again going back to the most important thing that you can have is your sphere of influence you know I, i've got a very large you know you know sphere of influence and great great people i mean some of them some people would say they're they're some are very wealthy some aren't. I mean, some run nonprofits for that matter. <laughs> but every time that I have a property that I'm going to be selling, you know, it goes out to the traditional marketing segments to, you know, Zillow, Trulia, Google, you know, all of our different websites and things like that. But probably the most beneficial group that it goes to is my sphere of influence. Because every time they get an email from me, they'll click on it. And it's, I always say, you know, never underestimate the power of your network. It's not who you know. It's, you know, it's who Michael knows. If I send something to you, you know, you know, I may know you're not, in the, you're not in the market to buy a, you know, a, a new home or a development project or whatever. But you're like, oh, that looks interesting. You may have just been in a conversation or a lunch meeting with somebody yes, you know, the day before that says, I, I we've been looking for this. It's like, I I got a guy. <laughs> I just got something in my email that you might be interested in. And that, you know, that's how it grows. Yeah. You I know. think I think that's so important that um, you know not you know for newer agents or anybody to not be afraid to send those those new listings on the market or anything to you know your your past clients even the ones that you know aren't in the market to purchase exactly. right now well that's that's what i try to impress upon agents is that you know, going going back you know it's stepping back a few years but you know like i said when i got in this business it was like well gosh everybody i know is my client well, when I got in the business, you know, I, you know, I was, I was 25, but I probably looked like I was, you know, 15. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so, you know, I would just call up people. It's like, well, these are the parents of some friends that I went to high school with, you know, they're my clients too, because I've been to their house. <laughs> you know, the idea of them handing me their house to go list or, sell or sell them a property at the time they went that's cute we're glad that you're in the business but no we're we're not going to be your guinea pigs and so it's a tough prop you know business to break into 
you know, usually most agents' first transaction is a, you know, a family member or a friend. And sometimes that's their last transaction. Um, but as you, as you grow and you keep growing that list, you start, you know, people start talking and, and you gain credibility by what you do and how you act. And, you know, and you constantly have to be in front of those people. Like I tell the agents all the time, if you are not talking to your clients, somebody else is. And that's the, you know, that's the, you know, the knife in the heart you know, thing that you get is, you know, you're thinking, okay, these are my past clients. I've sold them property, whatever. And then you, you log into your computer one morning and you see their houses on the market. You go, what happened? Well, if you haven't talked to them in five years, well, whose fault is that? I, I think NAR, National Association of Realtors, did a study that people were, people were surveyed after buying a house, living in a house for, I think it was three years. And it was almost, almost 80% of them couldn't remember the name of the agent that sold them the house. So, you know, if your past clients have gone on to somebody else, you are to blame. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> my, uh, my last question, you know, last uh, kind of topic I wanted to touch on with you uh, was, and you mentioned it earlier, um, is how important, you know, the goal setting was mm -hmm. for you, um, you know, for new agents and then even, you know, seasoned agents. How important is that to really have, um, you know, set goals out in front of you to where you, you always are pushing yourself to get better? It's paramount. I mean, and it's, it's something that you, know, you should never stop doing. Your career aspirations and things like that are going to change over time. But, you know, I, it, just like when I talk with clients, you know, it, it's amazing when I ask people, what do you want? If you ask a bigger question, what do you want out of life? They can't answer it. They, they just give you the deer in the headlights look because they don't know. They, they've never written it down. It's like, you know, you, you know I, I, I've given this talk before. It's, uh, you know, to be successful takes three things. One, raise your standards. Most people don't have high standards. And when I, when I say that, I mean, I can give you a few examples. The, for me, I get up at four o'clock in the morning and there's days when I'm tired and, and I, you know, I'm trying to justify in my head because it's cold and it's like, oh, yeah, I got a tickle in my throat. Maybe I should sleep in. It's my standard. If, if I say I'm going to do this many transactions this year, that's mine. It's my standard. The hardest thing you'll do is raise your standard. This, you know, the hard thing that's harder than that is to maintain it. And when I say that most people, you know, to set yourself above, it doesn't take much. Look around. It seems like, you know, we're, we're in a race to the bottom right now. Everybody's a minimalist. What is the least I have to do to not get fired, to still get a paycheck or in our business to have my clients not call and scream at me? <laughs> You know, what is the minimum? So if you raise your standards a little bit, you're going to stand out. It, it makes you special. The, you know, the second thing you need to do is come up with a strategy, a goal. You know, know what you want to get. It's like I use the, you know, it's, it's like the Britney Spears song. Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. <laughs> it's like, write it down. If you say, hey, I'm in the business and I'm going to, you know, my goal is to do, you know, $10 million in transactions this year, write that down. And then secondly, ask yourself why. <laughs> if you know why you want to achieve something, there's a good chance you will. So, you know, write down your goals. You know, I, I tell people it's a great thing when you come up with a goal is write it down. You know, if most people do New Year's, you know, Eve resolutions, they think about it. It's like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. And poof, it's gone. There's the next level of person that actually writes down, this is my goal. This is what I'm going to do this year. They've, they've gone to the next level. 
the next level of someone that writes it down, shares it with people they know, posts it on the wall. It's like, chances are they're going to get there. It's like, you know, the one thing that people hate in life more than failing is for other people to know that they failed. <laughs> it's like, you've raised the game. You've raised your standards. The, and the third thing is, you know, coming up with a strategy. So there's three things that you have to have to succeed in this world. You have to have higher standards. You have to have goals. And you have to have a strategy. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm honored and always dumbfounded when I, I have people say, oh, hey, I want you to teach me. It's like, I'm not very smart. <laughs> you know, it just said I couldn't read when I graduated high school. The smartest people in the world, most of them have written books. It's like, if you just want a strategy, go to Barnes & Noble. Those are the best-selling books in the world. And you can go through row after row, and they'll tell you how to be the best real estate agent, the best cook, best husband, best lawyer. It's all there. And they'll tell you exactly what they did. I mean, Warren Buffett has a book. <laughs> it's right. like, tell you how to be the best investor. <laughs> if it was just knowing what to do step by step, the world would be filled with successful people, but we're not. Because if you don't possess the first two, you can't get there. You know, and, and to make it in real estate, it's not an easy business. You know, it's, it used to be an 80-20 you know, rule. 80% you know, of the business was done by 20% of the people. Now with technology, it's more of a 90-10. I mean, I look at it all the time. I get the sheets and say, you know, who's, who's the number one in the county? It's called broker metrics. It doesn't matter what somebody puts in the newspaper or you know, online. This is fact. <laughs> this is what closed. And it's like the, the difference between the top, you know, you'll have people that are doing you know, you know, $200 million a year in sales. And then there's you know, probably four people. And then it drops all the way down to, you know, 60. And then there's a couple more people and then it drops down to like, you know, 30. Right. And then on down the line. I mean, it falls off fast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and you had mentioned it earlier just about um, going to those different seminars and picking little bits and pieces, mm -hmm. you know, from those different pe people. And, you know, we are in an era but i mean there's so much information out there and there's so many people like yourself that are willing to share how they've found success and it all it does i mean you can be picking up this information on your drive to work or you drive to your next listing and i think that's what's so uh so great about the real estate community as a whole is just the willingness for so many people like yourself to share uh their successes and and some of their tips no and i think and again i think firmly believe that. I mean, I, I've had some wonderful mentors and teachers in my life. And, you know, when I got in, you know, into this business and, you know, my business world, I knew nothing. I had no formal training. I had no college education, you know, had no money. <laughs> it was just like, so when I met somebody that was the type of person that I wanted to be, or at least from the outside, I thought I wanted to be, you know, I was, you know, I was like a barnacle. I'd latch myself onto them so fast and just, you know, can I take you to lunch? Can we have coffee? You want a glass of wine? It was just like, tell me your story. And, you know, some of the things, you know, some of these people you talk to, you know, re regardless of what people may perceive out there in the world, most wealthy people are self-made. I mean, there, there's, you know, there is a lot of trust fund babies and stuff like that out there. And, you know, that's, you know, God bless them. You know, their parents worked hard. Yeah. But most of them made it. And the one thing that I've learned is that, you know, some of the greatest mentors I've had and, and their clients, their personal friends, some of them are business partners of mine now. When, they worked there, they bootstrapped it up, you know, some of them, you know, college, some of them doctors, I mean, you name it. But when they, you know, when they see somebody that's willing to work hard, put in the time, 
not looking for something for nothing. It's like, it's, you know, it's that raised standard thing I just talked about. They they're, they look at you, their eyebrows come up, go, ah, oh, this person's different. They will give you the time. They will give you the wisdom and the knowledge. The, you know, I used to say that, you know, years ago, there was reasons why some people weren't smart or didn't, you know, didn't have, they didn't have access to things. They didn't have access to books. They didn't have access to the stuff that we have now. It's like, you know, now if you don't know something, you're just lazy. You can, you know, I'm amazed. I mean, you you can get onto YouTube and figure out how to do anything. Right. It's <laughs> like you can rebuild an engine, you can build a house right. <laughs> from a YouTube video. Absolutely. Because you take the time to do it. You know, if you want to be a great real estate agent, and, you know, they have your podcasts and they have other resources at their fingertip. So, you know, to just say, I don't know, means you didn't try that hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really do appreciate you taking the time, uh, you know, to share your story and then also, you know, uh, touch on uh, so many of these great things. And I really, I, you know, I am a big believer in the fact that all this information, it is, it is readily available. It's, it's there. You just got to go out and, and find it and put go it into it. action. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go get it. And then when you learn it, teach it to someone else. I mean, there's, there's, there's a certain you know, a certain feeling that, you know, I always say when you, when you help somebody else, that is something that you will never, ever forget. I mean, I, you know, I do a lot of work at a homeless shelter and, you know, sit across the table from some of those people. And when, when they call you a year later and they're in a house and they tell you that it was because you know, some of the talks that you had with them, you will remember that the rest of your life. So it's like, you know, and and everybody around you, you know, you don't have to tell them. You don't have to tell people, hey, I'm a great guy. I volunteer for this or that. They'll know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, I really do appreciate you taking the uh, time to talk with us today. You bet. <laughs> so my pleasure. I really want to thank David for joining us today. He was full of such great insightful advice for not only finding success in real estate, but life in general. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode, but remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.